Good evening, I'm Melissa Ridgen with your APTN News Weekend. We begin in the Atlantic region where a Mi'kmaq community is exercising their treaty right to harvest lobster on their own terms. Shabaganagadi First Nation is relinquishing their commercial fishing licenses to start off their treaty fishery without federal approval. Angel Moore brings us up to date. I'm here in Sebaganagadi First Nation, where Chief Mike Sack announced the new treaty fishery plan. It will be a five-month season and outside of the government-authorized commercial season. Sack said Canada does not have the authority to regulate. But for us, it's not about um, us fitting into the world that Canada or anybody else wants us to. As far as we're concerned, we're going to um, move forward with our own season as scheduled. The band intends to relinquish nine commercial lobster licenses to the Department of Fisheries and will instead redistribute the traps to the treaty fishery. The big argument was that um, everyone said there was, wasn't room in that fishery for any more traps. So, you know, we took it upon ourselves to make our own room. Conservation and research will be part of the fishery, led by Dalhousie professor Megan Bailey, who says that studies on seasonal fishing are biased because they only focus on commercial fishing. We tend to collect data in relation to the commercial fishery. We use fisheries dependent data to learn um, about the stocks that we, that we exploit. The treaty fishery is planned for the St. Mary's Bay area, officially known as LFA 34. Sebaganagadi now calls Treaty Area 1, where the fishery was launched last fall from Sonyaville Wharf. That was met with violence from the non-indigenous fishers who say the fishery is illegal. The police were criticized for standing by while the Mi'kmaq were attacked. SAC is calling on United Nations peacekeepers to step in. In my mind, our people are so mistreated. So if we say we're going to fish there in full force, there's going to be hundreds of DFO officers. Last year, you couldn't find one. So it's uh, systemic racism, and it's what Canada does, and we're hoping that um, United Nations will hold them accountable. In an email statement, the Department of Fisheries said they have not received a request from Sebaganagadi First Nation to relinquish their fishing licenses. Fishing must occur within the established seasons, and Chief Sack is welcome to join discussions any time. Meanwhile, the community members of Sebaganagadi will be meeting with, to discuss the meaning of a moderate livelihood. The treaty fishery is planned to launch this June at Sonyville Wharf. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Sebaganagadi, First Nation. Five First Nations on the west coast of British Columbia are celebrating after a unanimous decision by the BC Court of Appeal that recognizes their right to harvest and sell fish. APTN's Tina House has that story. The Nechanov have fought long and hard since a landmark decision in BC Supreme Court in 2009 that granted them their inherent fishing rights. Since then, the government appealed the decision. Now, almost 11 years later, the Nechanov have once again won in the courts after the BC Court of Appeals unanimously agreed with them. It's been a long time coming and it's about time, eh? Uh... What the court upheld was uh, a lot of the original decision and uh, ruled that uh, the government was not justified in infringing on our right to harvest and commercially sell aquatic resources. Atlio says it's a victory that's going to affect future generations. i old enough to have been around when our community was totally self-sustained. And uh, we looked after each other and we built our own homes, not with any government assistance, but ourselves, because we could. And uh, we want to return to that way of life. It's taken not only time, but a tremendous amount of money to get to this point. But for the Nechanoth Nation, it also means being able to continue a way of life that they inherited from their ancestors. We have a right to be a part of an inherent right to be a part of commercial fisheries on the coast because there was a government that recognized our reservations, small little dots on the coast of British Columbia because First Nations depended on the ocean. Not a complicated thing, but they have very short memories. And they had an agenda with regards to First Nation people, and it was not a good agenda. It was about doing away with our people, and they've tried that in many different ways, and we've survived all those ways. 
the court's decision means they can start harvesting fish and shellfish and start to develop a much-needed economy, as well as showing what true reconciliation means. I think that we've got an opportunity now to help the government actually put some substance and, and definition to what reconciliation really is. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. Earlier this month, APTN News showed you a video of a violent confrontation between a woman and a security guard outside a Freshco grocery store in Saskatoon. Well, this week, the woman held a press conference with the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations. APTN's Priscilla Wolf has those details. Annette Custer, the woman in the video, appeared at the FSIN conference but was too traumatized by the incident to speak to the media. Vice Chief Chris Job of the Prince Albert Ground Council says he's from the same community as Custer and he is glad someone recorded what happened. Racial discrimination. When you watch that video, it traumatizes you. When my wife was watching that video, she started tearing up. Is this for real? We lost in touch within our inner human being. Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations Vice Chief Heather Bear, who also works with the Women's Commission, says the excess of force is an example of the treatment our Indigenous women and girls face. Now, this is not an isolated incident. This is an incident, an incident that occurs more often than not when it comes to Indigenous women and girls. Uh, the mistreatment, the abuse, the attacks, uh, the racism, the marginalization. Legal counsel Michael Seed says they are calling on the Saskatoon Police Service to investigate and look into charging the guard. We are calling on the Saskatoon Police Service to take action against that specific individual, to lay criminal charges if necessary, but to seriously investigate Annette's complaint against the security guard. The Saskatoon Police Service says that the incident is still under investigation. Priscilla Wolf, AP10 National News, Saskatoon. Officials in the Yukon are calling on the next government to invest in a safe consumption site to help the territory's opioid crisis. Since 2016, 40 people have died from opioids in the Yukon. Seven of those deaths are from this year alone. While there are supports in place in the territory, like free naloxone kits and suboxone programs, and drug testing, the Yukon's chief medical officer of health says that a safe consumption site is also needed to help curb the deaths. And I think Yukon, again, should strongly consider establishment of an overdose prevention site, or OPS, where harm reduction supplies and supports can be in place for people to safely use drugs that they have already obtained. And by bringing people to a safe place to use drugs, they're no longer using drugs alone or away from care. And repeatedly with these deaths, we've seen the majority using drugs alone. Time for a commercial break, but still ahead, Lake of the Woods cottage owners are upset that a First Nation has ended road use agreements with them, making them only boat access. We'll tell you all about it. Welcome back. A First Nation near Northern Ontario's popular cottage country on Lake of the Woods has blocked road access for hundreds of cottagers. Mushagamas Bay First Nation announced last summer that it was ending these road use agreements, frustrated by increased traffic and speeding among the reasons for doing so. Well, now the association that represents those who have been denied access are speaking out. Sterile Stranger has more. It's been nearly a year since cottagers in Ontario's Lake of the Woods area have not had access to the main road onto their properties. That's because Mackenzie Portage Road runs through Washagamas Bay First Nation. And last July, the First Nation cut off access for 114 families. Now, the South End Road Association, which represents these residents, is calling for dialogue between the two parties. We're also concerned about the future of our community. All we are asking for is a chance a chance to talk to Washington's Bay and its leaders, a chance to understand what happened, fix any problems that exist, and to reach a new agreement that keeps everyone safe and allows us to return to our previous relationship with our neighbors. 
The First Nation cited concerns of speeding and the amount of road use and guests coming in as reasons for terminating the agreements. The association, however, says that not having road access is a major problem should health concerns come up. Wayne Workington is a resident who traveled to Kenora by ATV over the ice. While there, he had a heart failure and was able to get to hospital. He says if something like that were to happen now, the situation would be much different. If that had happened two days later, we'd have been stuck out here with no way out of here. You know, um, and my wife by herself, it's hard to say what would have happened. But now we're, we're concerned, we're scared um, for ourselves, my family, for the other families that are out here. If something like this happens at this time, things are going to get worse. Residents currently have to come and go by boat from nearby Kenora and in the winter by ice roads. There are roughly 200 or so property owners that are leasing the land from the band until 2047 and they have not been impacted by this decision. The association does not want to take legal action, but to open a line of communication with the First Nation once again. First and foremost, um, I think we'd have to apologize. I'd like to say I'm sorry. And, you know, go from there. APTN reached out to Washagamas Bay First Nation for comment, but did not hear back. However, last year's spokesperson Marvin Sinclair Sr. said the decision was not up for negotiation. Uh, I think we're at an impasse where we're just going to have to try and resolve this uh, in a way that, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, I, know there, I know there's people out there that are, uh, you know, uh, singing the blues right now, you know, and, 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 uh, and it's quite unfortunate that that's the situation. However, we did not, uh, we are not the developers that made com com long-term commitments to these people uh, about access. Uh, they should have been speaking directly to the First Nation. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. A former residential school building in northern BC is set to be demolished and replaced with a cultural center. The building operated as a residential school from 1951 to 1975 in the Cascadena community of Lower Post on the BC Yukon border. Until last year, it acted as a post office and office space, but is a source for trauma for many survivors and their families. The federal government pledged $11.5 million for the new multi-purpose cultural building, which will include recreational, educational, and cultural spaces. The new building, uh, it's going to be a new start. We've been, uh, we've been making, making things work with uh, having to work out of that building for, for many years, but uh, I think it's going to be finally a... a a turning point for our government to to make some big changes um, to start moving forward in a positive way. It's been a dream 40 years in the making, but a safe space for adult women and the two LGBTQ plus community is opening in Winnipeg. Brittany Hobson reports. And then we'll just walk around the house, and I always do the pantry. Every morning before the doors open at Velma's house, Isabel Daniels smudges the space. This ceremony is repeated throughout the day. The first thing we do, especially if they're upset, is that we light a smudge, we sit with them, and we smudge with them, offer them some water, some tea. Velma's house is a drop-in safe space for women and 2S LGBTQ plus people. The home specifically offers resources to adult women who may be experiencing homelessness, violence, or exploitation. Daniels is a program coordinator. For years, she has been part of a group of advocates who have pushed for this space. Two of my sisters have died in, in you know, due to violence and in the wake of, of having, you know, hoping to have a place like this because if they had a place like this, we would have saved people a lot sooner, right? Or we could have had the chance to, you know, provide safety for, for women who are escaping street violence, not just spousal violence but street violence. The home opened last month and is being run through Ganiganichik, a Winnipeg-based Indigenous organization. It's named after Velma Orvis, a prominent elder in the city. Daniel says Orvis gave endless love to anyone who needed it. She passed away last year. And the woman really felt like it should be named after her for all of the 
for all of the efforts and the advocacy she did for women that were were um, either entrenched in exploitation or homelessness or addiction, she provided supports and services for a lot of our women, um, even if they weren't sober. Visitors can do laundry, take a shower, and access food and harm reduction tools. Staff use their own lived experiences to help guide the work. Velma's House is, um, is survivor-led. Um, it's uh, all of our, our all of our staff have either somewhat been um, have experienced in um, exploitation or homelessness or gangs or addictions. Um, it's indigenous led, um, and I think that makes a I think that it makes a difference in how we approach our people is because we know what it's like to walk in through those doors. We know what it's like to be that person accessing a space like this. And I came here so I could focus on using my trauma and using my lifestyle experiences to empower other women and, you know, and to let them know that there is hope. Anisha Sadler is a support worker at the home. She's a survivor of street violence and a former drug user. With a solid support system, she was able to go back to school and has been doing frontline work since. She hopes to pass on that support to women at Velma's house. I want people to build up their confidence and know that, you know, they are good enough and they're worth it. Seeing so many times through our life we're made to feel like we're worthless and that's just not true for anybody. The space operates seven days a week on a reduced schedule. They hope to be fully operational 24 hours a day by the fall. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Time for another break, but when we come back, virtual cooking classes that'll leave you drooling. Stay with us. Welcome back. A new large-scale mural honoring survivors of the residential school system is going up in a small city north of Winnipeg. The months-long project brought together elders, artists, and students to complete the final piece. And those involved say the process of, uh, is a representation of true collaboration between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. Here's Brittany Hobson. This is just a portion of Mashkawi Gabawud Abanijiag, or Stand Strong Children. This new large-scale mural installation will be put on public display in the city of Selkirk. Standing at 12 feet tall and 160 feet long, the piece recognizes the legacy of the residential school system. Something this important, I think, deserves that big of a canvas. Jordan Stranger is the designer of the piece. He worked with elders to bring the final piece to life. Stranger says the size of the project allowed him to tell a full story, but it had to be simple. Starting from, you know, the beginnings of our the Indigenous peoples of Canada, and how wholesome we were and how connected we were to the land. And then that transition into those dark times, um, you know, being stripped of your culture and being taken from your families, and then eventually carries on into, you know, the mourning of the loss, the mourning of the loss of culture. And then thinking about, okay, what happens now? Ernie Daniels is a residential school survivor and one of the elders who contributed to the project. I think they captured the essence of the message for me, which is survival, resilience, and hope. The project was led by Jeannie Red Eagle. The emerging artist has lived in Selkirk for years. She says art can be a way to honor the history of Indigenous peoples, both bad and good. It's important to pay respect to that, to pay respect to that process. Um, and it's also important that we as Indigenous people understand the significance of our history so that we can go forward in a really good way and so that we can help heal together with each other, with our community, with our families, but also within our, communi within our, our non-Indigenous community. The project brought together Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists, as well as local youth. Sierra Anderson spent the last two months lending her hand. Uh, for me, it's been all about, A, learning and getting to learn about those teachings and the things that, you know, 
I missed out on growing up, the things that have been forgotten in my family, as well as the path to healing through creating something so beautiful out of something so terrible. The piece will be put on display sometime this summer. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Selkirk. It's beautiful. Well, to Ontario, where a community wellness program is hosting a series of virtual events. They focus on either mind, body, or spirit, as Ontario faces stricter lockdown measures in the latest focused on food. The latest one is focused on food. Uh, here's Annette Francis with that story from Six Nations. The vegetables are ready, the meat is prepared, and the fire is perfect. Now it's time to start cooking. So what we're doing today is we're cooking some bison uh, tomahawks and some early spring vegetables and we're using fire as a means to, to carry that out and um, have some fun and uh, promote a message. Using food as, a, as, as medicine or as, as a vehicle. The message to being to shared to by Six Nations celebrity chef Rich again. Francis uh, is how to prepare the healthy traditional foods. To, um, Francis is a special food, guest for the fifth like we, virtual community we have, uh, wellness series. The you know, sessions the began like because of the pandemic. This one is dubbed Food for Medicine. Everything that we're using today is kind of from this, you know, what's happening today, you know, like asparagus. Uh, we didn't have the time, but uh, I wanted to find some fiddleheads, some ramps, and ultimately cooking for the seasons and whatever that means, you know. And I think when we stay into the, you know, the integrity of using uh, seasonal ingredients, we can just ultimately get more connected that way uh, to our food sources and what we're eating. Francis's two sons joined in on the cookout. Holden is also a chef. He has been sharing indigenous cuisine alongside his dad for the past three years. He says it's been a great opportunity during the pandemic. It's really important to know for the community, uh, being able to grow your own food and knowing exactly where your food comes from is a huge part for yourself and very important to know. Uh, just to take care of yourself and not ordering out every night or just, you know, making, having someone else make your food for you and not knowing exactly what's going in it. Braden's going to put it on here. Twelve-year-old Braden took over the reins too. He was happy with the results. It was amazing. The colors and flavors are all over the place. Chef Francis encourages families to get outside to cook and enjoy the foods that Mother Nature has to offer. The next community says, wellness event will be held in two weeks. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Six Nations. Delicious. Well, that is your news for this weekend. Visit our website to catch up on anything that you may have missed, aptnnews.ca. I'm Melissa Ridgen. We will see you back here on Monday.